Introduction to the Wonderful Adventures of Fra the Phoenician by Edwin Lester Arnold. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Introduction by Sir Edwin Arnold, KCIE. In the garden of my Japanese home in Tokyo, I have just perused the last sheets of my son's philosophical and historical romance, Fra the Phoenician. Among other scenes, I might be led to analyse, to criticise, perhaps a little to argue about the singular hypothesis on which he builds his story. Here, with a Buddhist temple at my gate, and with Japanese Buddhists around me, nothing seems more natural than that an author, sufficiently gifted with imagination and study, should follow his hero beyond the narrow limits of one little existence down the chain of many lives taken up link by link after each long interval of rest and reward in the paradise of jo do i have read several chapters to my asiatic friends and they say oh yes it is ingwa it is karma that is all quite true we also have lived many times and shall live many times more on this earth one of them opens the shoji to let a purple and silver butterfly escape into the sunshine she thinks some day it will thank her perhaps a million years hence moreover here is a passage which i lately noted suggestive enough to serve as preface even by itself to the present book commenting on a line in my song celestial the writer thus remarks the human soul should therefore be regarded as already in the present life connected at the same time with two worlds of which so far as it is confined to personal unity to a body the material only is clearly felt it is therefore as good as proved or to be diffuse it could easily be proved or better still it will hereafter be proved i know not where or when that the human soul even in this life stands in indissoluble community with all immaterial natures of the spirit world that it mutually acts upon them and receives from them impressions of which however as man it is unconscious as long as all goes well it is therefore truly one and the same subject which belongs at the same time to the visible and to the invisible world but not just the same person since the representations of the one world by reason of its different quality are not associated with ideas of the other and therefore what i think as spirit is not remembered by me as man i myself have consequently taken the stupendous postulates of fra's narrative with equanimity if not acceptance and derived from it a pleasure and entertainment too great to express since the critic in this case is a well-pleased father the author of fra has claimed for romance the ancient license accorded to poetry and painting pictoribus atque poetis quid libit audendi semper fuit aqua potestas he has supposed a young phoenician merchant full of the love of adventure and endowed with a large and observant if very mystic philosophy such as would serve for no bad standpoint whence to witness the rise and fall of religions and peoples the adventurer sets out for the tin islands or Cassiterides, at a date before the roman conquest of england he dies and lives anew many times but preserves his personal identity under the garb of half a dozen transmigrations and yet while renewing in each existence the characteristic passions and sentiments which constitute his individuality and preserve the unity of the narrative the author seems to me to have adapted him to varying times and places with a vraisemblance and absence of effort which are extremely effective a briton in british days the slave consort of his druid wife he passes by daring but convenient inventiveness into the person of a centurion in the household of a noble roman lady who illustrates in her surroundings the luxurious vices of the latter empire with some relic still of the older republican virtues hence he glides again into oblivion yet wakes from the mystical slumber in time to take part in king harold's gallant but fatal stand against the normans 
he enjoys the repose as a saxon thane which the policy of the conqueror granted to the vanquished but after some startling adventures in the vast oak woods of the south kingdom is rudely ousted from his homestead by the foreigners and in a neighbouring monastery sinks into secular forgetfulness once more of wife and children lands and life on the return of consciousness he finds himself enshrined as a saint thanks to the strange physical phenomena of his suspended animation and learns from the abbot that he has lain there in the odour of sanctity according to indisputable church records during three hundred years he wanders off again finding everything new and strange and becomes an english knight under king edward the third he is followed to crecy by a damsel who from act to act of his long life drama similarly renews an existence linked with his own and who constantly seeks his love she wears the armour of a brother knight and on the field of battle she sacrifices her life for his yet once more the long spell of sleep which is not death brings this much wandering fra to the reign of queen elizabeth and it is there after many and strange vicissitudes he writes his experiences and the curtain finally falls over the last passage of this remarkable record such briefly is the framework of a creation which while it has certainly proved to me extremely seductive as a story is full i think of philosophical suggestiveness as long as men count mournfully the years of that human life which m renan has declared to be so ridiculously short so long their fancies will hover about the possibility of an elixir vitae of splendidly extended spans like those ascribed to the old patriarchs and meditate with fascination on the mystical doctrines of buddhism and the vedantas in such a spirit the egyptians wrapped their dead in careful fashion after filling the body with preservatives and if ancient tombs have the seven sleepers of the koran the danish king who dozes under the castle of elsinore and our own undying king arthur do we not go to see rip van winkle at the play and is not hibernation one among the problems of modern science which whispers that we might if we liked indefinitely adjourn the waste of corporeal tissue and spread our seventy or eighty years over ever so many centuries but to be charming an author is not obliged to be credible or what would become of the arabian nights of gulliver of the best books in the library personally i admire and i like fra enormously and being asked to pen these few lines by way of introduction i counsel everybody to read it forgetting who it is that respectfully offers this advice until the end of the book when i shall be no longer afraid if they remember tokyo japan April the fourteenth, eighteen ninety. End of introduction. Prologue to the Wonderful Adventures of Fra the Phoenician by Edwin Lester Arnold. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Prologue. Well and truly, an inspired mind has written. One man in his time plays many parts but surely no other man ever played so many parts in the course of a single existence as i have my own narrative seems incredible to me yet i am myself a witness of its truth when i say that i have lived in this england more than one thousand years and have seen her bud from the callowest barbarity to the height of a prosperity and honour with which the world is full i shall at once be branded as a liar let it pass the accusation is familiar to my ears i tired of resenting it before your father's fathers were born and the scorn of your offended sense of veracity is less to me than the lisping of a child i was in the very distance of the beginning a citizen of that ancient city whose dominion once stretched from the blue waters of the aegean round to and beyond the broad stream of the nile herself your antiquities were then my household gods your myths were my beliefs those facts and fancies on the very fringe of records about which you marvel were the commonplace things of my commencement 
yes and those dusty relics of humanity that you take with unholy zeal from the silent chambers of sarcophagi and pyramids were my boon companions the jolly revellers i knew long ago the good fellows who drank and sang with me through warm long-forgotten nights they were the great princes to whom i bent an always duteous knee and the fair damsels who tripped our sunny streets when sidon existed and tyre was not a matter of speculation or laughed at their own dainty reflections the golden leisure of that forgotten age where the black-legged ibis stood sentinel among the blue lotus flowers of the temple ponds since then what have i not done i have travelled to the corners of the world and forgotten my own land in the love of another i have sat here in britain at the tables of roman centurions and the last of her saxon kings died in my arms i have sworn hatred of foreign tyrants in the wassail bowls of serfs and bestrode norman charges in tilt-yards and battlefields the kingdoms of the misty western islands which it was my wonderful fortune to see submerged by alternate tides of conquest i have seen emerge triumphant with all their conquerors welded into one i have seen more battles than i can easily recall and war in every shape i have enjoyed all sorts of peace from the rudest to the most cultivated i have lived in fact more than one thousand years in this sea-girt island of yours and so strange and grim and varied have been my experiences that i am tempted to set them down with a melancholy faith in my own uniqueness though it is more than probable few will believe me yet for this i care nothing nor do i especially seek your approval of my labours i who have tasted a thousand pleasures and am hoary with disappointments can afford to hold your censure as lightly as i should your commendation here then are my adventures and this is how they commenced End of prologue. Chapter One of the Wonderful Adventures of Fra the Phoenician by Edwin Lester Arnold. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Regarding the exact particulars of my earliest wanderings, I do confess that I am somewhat uncertain this may tempt you to reply that one whose memory is so far-reaching and capacious as mine will presently prove might well have stored up everything that befell him from his very beginning all i can say is things are as i set them down and those facts which you cannot believe you must continue to doubt the first thirty years of my life it will be guessed in extenuation were full of the frailties and shortcomings of an ordinary mortal while those years which followed have impressed themselves indelibly upon my mind by right of being curious past experience and credibility looking back then into the very remote past is like looking upon a country which a low sun at once illuminates and blurs i dimly perceive in the golden haze of the ancient time a fair city rising tier upon tier out of the blue waters of the midland sea a splendid harbour frames itself out of the mellow uncertainty a harbour whereof the long white arms are stretched out to welcome the commerce of all the known world and under the white fronts and at the temple steps of that ancient city commerce poured into the lap of luxury every commodity that could gratify cupidity or minister to human pleasure i was young then no doubt nor need i say a fool and very likely the sight of a thousand strange sails at my father's door excited my daily wonder while the avarice which recognises no good fortune in a present having was excited by the silks and gems the rich stuffs and the gums the quaint curiosities of human ingenuity and the frolic things of nature which were piled up there more than all my imagination must have been fired by the sea captain's tales of wonder or romance and be the cause what it may i made up my mind to adventure like them and carry out my wilful fancy it is a fitting preface to all i have learnt since that my first real remembrance should be one of vanity yet so it was more than a thousand years ago i will not lower my record by a single lustre to propitiate your utmost unbelief 
I set out on a first voyage. It might be yesterday, so well it comes before me, with my youthful pride, as the spirit of a man was born within, and I felt the strong beat of the fresh salt waves of the open sea upon my trading vessel's prow, and knew, as I stood there by her steering oar, that she was stuffed with a hundred bales of purple cloth from my father's vats along the shore, and bound whither I listed. Who could have been prouder than I? Who could have heard finer songs of freedom in the merry hum of the warm southern air, in the brown cordage overhead, or the frothy prattle of the busy water alongside, as we danced that day out of the white arms of Tyre, the queenly city of the ancient seas, and saw the young world unfurl before us, full of magnificent possibilities. It is not my wish or intention to write of my early travels, were it possible. On this voyage, or it may be on some others that followed, now merged into the associations of the first, we traded east and west with adventure and success. The adventure was sure enough, for the great Midland Sea was then the centre of the world, and what, between white-winged argosies of commerce, the freebooters of a dozen nations who patrolled its bays and corners, and rows of royal galleys sailing to the conquest of empires, it was a lively and perilous place enough. As for the profit, it came quickly to those who opened a hundred virgin markets in the olden days. We sailed into the great Egyptian river up to Heliopolis, bartering stuffs for gold dust and ivory. At another time, we took Trinacrian wine and oranges into Ostia, a truly magnificent port, with incredible capacities for all the fair and pleasant things of life. Then we sailed among the beautiful Achaean islands, with corn and olives, and so, profiting everywhere, we lived, for long, a jolly, uncertain life, full of hardship and pleasure. For the most part we hugged the coasts, and avoided the open sea. It was from the little bays, whose mouths we thus crossed, that the pirates we greatly dreaded dropped down upon merchantmen, like falcons from their perches. When they took a vessel that resisted, the crew, at those rough hands, got scant mercy. I have come across a galley drifting idly before the wind, with all her crew, a grim row of skeletons, hanging in a row along her yard, and swinging this way and that, and rattling drearily against the sail and each other, in melancholy unison with the listless wallow of their vessel. At another time, a Roman trireme fell upon a big pirate of Melita, and stormed and captured her. The three hundred men on board were too ugly and wicked to sell, so the Romans drove them overboard like sheep, and burned the boat. When we sailed over the spot at sundown the next day, she was still spluttering and hissing, with the water lapping over the edge of her charred side, and round among the curls of yellow smoke overhead. A thousand gulls were screeching, while a thousand more sat gorged and stupid upon the dead pirates. Not for many nights did we forget the evil picture of retribution, and how the setting sun flooded the sea with blood, and how the dead villains in all their horror swirled about in twos and threes in that crimson light, and fell into our wake, drawn by the current, and came jostling and grinning and nodding after us though we made all sail to outpace them in a gloomy procession for a mile or so. It often seemed to me in those days there were more freebooters afloat than honest men. At times we ran from these, at times we fought them, and again we would give a big marauder a share of cargo to save the ship from his kindred who threatened us. It was a dangerous game, and one never knew on rising where his couch would be at night nor whether the prosperous merchant of the morning might not be the naked slave of the evening, storing his own wealth in a robber cave under the lash of some savage sea-tyrant. Yet even these cruel rovers did me a good turn. We were short of water, and had run down along a lonely coast to a green spring we knew of, to fill water-butts and skins. When we let go in the little inlet where the well was to be found, Another vessel, and, moreover, a pirate, lay anchored before us. However, we were consciously virtuous, 
and what was of more consideration a larger vessel and crew than the other so we went ashore and made acquaintance round the fresh water with as villainous a gang of sea robbers as ever caused the blood of an honest trader to run cold in his veins the very air of their neighbourhood smelled so of treachery and cruelty we soon had but one thought to load up and be gone but this was a somewhat longer process than we wished as our friends had bailed the little spring dry and we had to wait its refilling while we did so i strolled over to a group of miserable slaves turned out for an airing and cowering on the black and shadeless rocks there were in that abject group captives from every country that fared upon those seas and some others besides the dusky peasant of boeotia that fronts the narrow straits wrung her hands by the fair-cheeked girl snapped up from the wide gulf of narbo the dark numidian pearl-fisher cursed his patron god and the tall achaean from the many islands of peloponnesian waters grit his teeth as he cowered beneath his rags and bemoaned the fate that threw him into the talons of the sea-hawks i looked upon them with small interest for new-taken slaves were no great sight to me until i chanced a little way from the others upon such a captive as i had rarely or never seen she struck me at once as being the fiercest and most beautiful creature that mortal eyes had ever lit upon never was umbrian or iberian girl like that never was cyprian aphrodite served by a maid so pink and white her hair was fiery red gold gleaming in the sunshine like the locks of the young goddess medusa her face was of ruddy ivory and her native comeliness gleamed through the unwashed dust and tears of many long days and nights her eyes were as blue under her shaggy wild hair as the sky overhead and her body grimy under its sorrow stains was still as fair as that of some dainty princess knowing the pirate captain would seek a long price for his property i determined to use a little persuasion with him i went back to my men and sent one of them proficient in the art of the bowstring to look at the slaves then i drew the unsuspecting scoundrel up there for a bargain and well out of sight of his gang we faced the red-haired girl and discussed her price the rascal's first figure was three hundred of your modern pounds a sum which would then have fetched the younger daughter of a sultan full of virtue and accomplishments as this girl very likely had neither one nor the other i did not see why it was necessary to pay so much and stroking my beard in an agreed signal with my hand as my man was passing behind the old pirate he slipped a length of twisted cloth over his wicked neck and tightened it with a jerk that nearly started the eyes from his head and brought him quickly to his knees now delicately minded one i said i don't want to fight you and your crew for this maid here on whom i've set my heart but you know we are numerous and well armed so let us have a peaceful and honest bargain give me a fairer price and obedient to my signal the band was loosened not a cestus will i take off spluttered the wretch not a drachma not an ounce come come think again i said persuasively and the cloth shall help you thereon another turn was taken and my henchman turned his knuckles into the nape of the swarthy villain's neck until the veins on his forehead stood out like cordage and the blood ran from his nose and eyes in a minute the rover threw up his hands and signed he had had enough and when he got his breath we found he had knocked off a hundred pounds we gave him the cord again and brought him down twist by twist to fifty by this time he was almost at his last gasp and i was contented paying the coins out on a rock and leaving them there with the rogue well bound i was always honest though as became the times a trifle hard at bargains then i cut the red maid loose and took her by the elbow and led her down to the beach where we were secretly picked up by my fellows and shortly afterwards we set sail again for the open main thus was acquired the figurehead of my subsequent adventures the siren who lured me to that coast where i have lived a thousand years and more it was the inscrutable will of destiny that those shining coins i paid down on the bare hot african rock 
should cost me all my wealth my cash and credit at many ports and that that fair slave who i deemed would serve but to lighten a voyage or two should mock my forethought and lead my fate into the strangest paths that ever were trodden by mortal foot in truth that sunny virago bewitched me she combined such ferocity with her grace and was so pathetic in her reckless grief at times that i the immovable was moved and softened the rigour of her mischance as time went on so much as might be at once on this like some caged wild creature which forgives to one master alone the sorrows of captivity she softened to me and before many days were over she had bathed and discarding her rags for a length or two of cloth had tied up her hair with a strand of ribbon she found and looking down at her reflection in a vessel of water her only mirror for we carried women but seldom she smiled for the first time after this progress was rapid and though at first we could only with difficulty make ourselves understood yet she soon picked up something of the southern tongue from me while i very fairly acquired the british language of this comely tutoress of her i learnt that she was of that latter country where her father was a chief how their coast village had been surprised by a southern rover's foray she knew not how many of the people slain or made captive and herself carried off afterwards she had fallen into the hands of other pirates by an act of sea barter and they were taking her to alexandria hoping as i guessed in that luxurious city to obtain a higher price than in the ordinary markets of gaul or italy what i heard of britain from these warm lips greatly fired my curiosity and after touching at several ports and finding trade but dull chance clenched my resolution we had sailed northward with a cargo of dates and on the sixth day ran in under the high promontory of massilia which you moderns call marseilles here i rid myself of the fruit at a very good profit and after talking to a brother merchant i met by chance upon the quay fully determined to load up with oil wine stuffs and such other things as he recommended and sail at once for britain little did i think how momentous this hasty decision would be it was brought about partly as i have explained and partly by the interest which just then that country was attracting all the weapons and things of britain were then in good demand no tin and gold the smiths roundly swore were like the british no furs in winter the roman ladies vowed were so warm as those while no patrician from tarentum to the tiber held his house well furnished unless a red-haired slave-girl or two from that remote place idled saddened listlessly in his painted porticoes in these slaves there was a brisk and increasing traffic i went into the markets that ran just along inside of the harbour one day and saw there an ample supply of such curious goods suitable for every need all down the middle of a wide street rough booths of sailcloth had been run up and about and before these crouched slaves of every age and condition there were old men and young men fierce and wild-looking barbarians in all truth some with the raw red scars on chest and limbs they had taken a few weeks before in a last stand for liberty and some groaning in the sickness that attended the slaver's lash and their condition there were lank-haired girls submitting with sullen hate to the appraising fingers of purchasers laughing and chatting in latin or gaulish as they dealt with them no more gently than a buyer deals with sheep where mutton is cheap mothers again sick and travel-stained themselves were soothing the unkempt little ones who cowered behind them and shrunk from every roman footstep as the quails shrink from a kestrel's shadow some of these children were very flowers of comeliness though trodden into the mire of misfortune i bought a little girl to attend upon her upon my ship who though she wore at the time but one sorry cloth and was streaked with dirt and dust had eyes as clear as the southern sky overhead and hair that glistened in uncared-for brightness upon her shoulders like a tissue of golden threads her mother was loath to part with her and fought like a tiger when we separated them 
it was only after the dealer's lash had cut a dozen red furrows into her back and a bystander had beat her on the head with the flat of his sword that she gave in and swooned and i led the weeping little one away so we loaded up again with eastern things such as the barbarians might be supposed to like and in a few weeks started once more we sailed down the green coast of hispania through the narrow waters of hercules fretum and then leaving the undulating hills of that pleasant strait behind turned northward through the long waves of the black outer sea for many days we rolled up a sullen and dangerous coast but one morning our pilot called me for my breakfast of fruit and millet cakes and pointing over the green expanse told me yonder white surf on the right was breaking on the steep rocks of armorica while the misty british shore lay ahead so i called out blodwin the slave and told her to snuff the wind and find out what it had to say she knew only too well and was vastly delighted wistfully scanning the long grey horizon ahead and being beside herself with eagerness we steered westwardly towards the outer islands called Cassiterides, where most of our people collected and bought their tin but we were fated not to reach them on the morrow so fierce a gale sprang out of the deep we could by no means stand against it but turned and fled through the storm and over such a terrible expanse of mighty billows as i never saw the like of to my surprise my girl thought naught of the wind and sea but came constantly to the groaning bullocks where the angry green water swirled and gleamed like a cauldron and holding on by a shroud looked with longing but familiar eyes at the rugged shore we were running down at one time i saw her smile to recognise close in shore and plunging heavily towards some unknown haven half a dozen of her own native fisher boats later on blodwin brightened up even more as the savage cliffs of the west gave way to rolling downs of grass and when these as we fled with the sea spume grew lower and were here and there clothed with woods and little specks among them of cornfields she shouted with joy and leaping down from the tall prow where she had stood indifferent to the angry thunder of the bursting surges upon our counter and the sting and rattle of the white spray that flew up to the swinging yard every time we dropped into the bosom of the angry sea she said exultingly with her face red and gleaming in a salt wet glaze she could guide us to a harbour if we would i was by this time a little sick at heart for the safety of all my precious things in bales and boxes below and something like the long invoice of them i knew so well rose in my throat every time we sank with a horrible sinking into one of those shadowy valleys between the hissing crests so i nodded blodwin at once made the helmsman draw us nearer the coast by the time we had approached the shore within a mile or so the white squalls were following each other fast while heavy columns of western rain were careering along the green sea in many tall spectral forms but nothing cared that purchase of mine she had gone to the tiller and like some wild goddess of the foam stood there her long hair flying on the wet sea wind and her fierce bright eyes aglow with pleasure and excitement as she scanned the white ramparts of the coast down which we were hurtling she was oblivious of the swarthy seamen who eyed her with wonder and awe oblivious of the white bed of froth which boiled and flashed all down the rim of our dripping gunwale and equally indifferent to the heavy rain that smoked upon our decks and made our straining sails as hard and stiff as wood just as the great shore began to loom over us and i sorely doubted my wisdom in sailing these unknown waters with such a pilot she gave a scream of pleasure an exulting triumphant note that roused a sympathetic chorus in the piping wildfowl overhead and following the point of her finger we saw the solid rampart of cliffs had divided and a little estuary was opening before us round went our felucca to the imperious gesture of that girl and gripping the throbbing tiller over the hands of the strong steersman aglow with excitement yet noting everything while the swart brown sailors shouted at the humming cordage she took us down through an angry cauldron of sea 
and over a foaming bar where i cursed in my haste every ounce i had spent upon her into the quieter water beyond and when a few minutes later reeking with salt spray but safe and sound we slowly rowed in with the making tide to a secure landlocked haven that brave girl left the rudder and going forward gave one look at the opening valley which i afterwards knew was her strangely recovered home and then her fair head fell upon her arms and leaning against the mast under the tent of her red hair she burst into a passionate storm of tears she soon recovered and stealing a glance at me as she wiped her lids with the back of her hands to note if i were angry her feminine perception found my eyes gave the lie to the frown upon my forehead so she put on some extra importance as though the air of the place suited her dignity and resumed command of the ship well there is much to tell so it must be told briefly we sailed into a fair green estuary with woods on either hand dipping into the water and nodding to their own glistening reflections until we turned a bend and came upon a british village down by the edge there were perhaps two hundred huts scattered round the slope of a grassy mound upon top of which was a stockade of logs and mud walls encompassing a few better built houses canoes and bigger boats were drawn up on the beach and naked children and dogs were at play along the margin while women and some few men were grinding corn and fashioning boat gear as our sails came round the headland with one single accord the population took to flight flung down their meal bags and tools tumbling over each other in their haste and yelling and scrambling they streamed away to the hill this amused blodwyn greatly and she let them run until the fat old women of the crowd had sorted themselves out into a panting rearguard half way up and the long-legged youngsters were already scrambling over the barrier then with her hand over her mouth she exerted her powerful voice in a long wailing signal cry the effect was instantaneous the crowd stopped hesitated and finally came scrambling down again to the beach and after a little parley being assured of their good will and greatly urged by blodwyn we landed and were soon overwhelmed in a throng of wondering jostling excited british but it was not me to whom they thronged but rather her and such wonder and surprise broadening slowly into joy as she with her nimble woman's tongue answered their countless questions i never witnessed at last they set up yelling and shouting and seizing her dragged and carried her in a tumultuous procession up the zigzag into the fortalice blodwyn had come home that was all and from a slave girl had blossomed into a princess never before was there such a yelling and chattering and blowing of horns and beating of shields while messengers rushed off down the woodland paths to rouse the country the villagers crowded round me and my men and having by the advice of one of their elders relinquished their first intention of cutting all our throats in the excess of their pleasure treated us very handsomely feeding and feasting the crew to the utmost of their capacity i as you will suppose was ill at ease for my fair barbarian who had thus turned the tables upon me and in whose power it was impossible not to recognise that we now lay how would the slave princess treat her captive master i was not long in doubt her messenger presently touched me on the shoulder as i sat a little rueful on a stone apart from my rollicking men and led me through that prehistoric village street up the gentle slope and between the oak log barrier into the long low dwelling that was at once the palace and the citadel of the place entering i found myself in a very spacious hall effective in its gloomy dignity all around the three straight sides the massive walls were hidden in a drapery of the skins and furs of bear wolf and deer and over these were hung in rude profusion light round shields embossed with shining metal knobs javelins and boar spears with a hundred other implements of war or woodcraft below them stood along the walls rough settles and benches with rougher tables enough to seat perhaps a hundred men at the crescent-shaped end of the hall 
facing the entrance door was a dais a raised platform of solid logs closely placed together and covered with skins upon which a massive and ample chair stood also of oak and wonderfully fashioned and carved by the patient labour of many hands nigh it were a group of women and one or two white-robed druids as these people call their priests but chief among them was she who stepped forth to meet me clad for her first idea had been to change her dress in fine linen and fair furs how i scarcely know save that they suited her marvellously fine chains of hammered gold were about her neck a shining gorget belt set with a great boss of native pearls upon her middle and her two bare white arms gleamed like ivory under their load of bracelets of yellow metal and prismatic pearl shell that clanked harmoniously to her every movement but the air she put on along with these fine things was equally becoming and she took me by the hand with an affectionate condescension while turning to her people she briefly harangued them running glibly over my virtues and bestowing praise upon the way in which i had rescued and restored her to her kindred until so gracefully did she pervert the truth i felt a blush of unwonted virtue under my callous skin and when they acclaimed me friend and ally i stood an inch taller among them to find myself of such unexpected worth one tall druid alone scowling on me evilly for long that pleasant village by the shallow waters remembered the coming of blodwyn to her own her kinsmen had all been slain in the raid of the sea rovers which brought about her captivity and thus the succession to headship and rule being very strictly observed among the britons she was elected after an absence of six months to the oak throne and the headship of the clan with an almost unbroken accord but that priest duallan her cousin and next below her in birth scowled again to see her seated there and hated me i saw as the unconscious thwarter of his ambition those were fine times and the princess bought my cargo of wine and oil and southern things distributing it to all that came to pay her homage so that for days we were drunk and jolly fires gleamed on twenty hilltops round about and the little becks ran red down to the river with the blood of sheep and bullocks slaughtered in sacrifice and the foot-tracks in the woods were stamped into highways and the fords ran muddy to the ocean and the grass was worn away and birds and beasts fled to quieter thickets and fishes swam out to the blue sea and everything was eaten up far and wide that time my fair slave-girl first put her foot upon the dais and prayed to the manes of her ancestors among the oak trees End of chapter one chapter two of the wonderful adventures of fra the phoenician by edwin lester arnold this librivox recording is in the public domain nothing whatever have i to say against blodwyn the beautiful british princess and many months we spent there happily in her town and she bore a son for whom the black priest at the accursed inspiration of his own jealous heart and thwarted hopes read out an evil destiny to her great sorrow going down one morning to the shore somewhat sad and sorry for the inevitable time of parting was near my ship lying ready loaded by the beach i rubbed my eyes again and again to see that the felucca had gone from the little inlet where she had lain so long nor was comfort at hand when rushing to a promontory commanding a better view to my horror there shone the golden speck of her sail in the morning sunlight on the blue rim of the most distant sea i have often thought since the crafty princess had a hand in this desertion she was so ready with her condolence so persuasive that i should bide the winter and leave her in the spring the which was said with her most detaining smile that i could not think the catastrophe took my gentle savage much by surprise i yielded and the long black winter was worn through among the british until 
when the yellow light came back again i had married blodwyn before all the tribe and was rich by her constant favour nor need it be said more loath than ever to leave her in truth she was a good princess but very variable blodwyn the chieftainess urging her clansmen to a tribal fight red hot with the strong drink of war or wrecking with the fumes and cruelty of a bloody sacrifice to baal was one thing and on the other hand blodwyn tending with the rude skill of the day her kinsman's wounds blodwyn the daughter weeping gracious silent tears in the hall of her father's as the minstrels chanted their praises or humming a ditty to the listening blue-eyed little one upon her knee his cheek to hers was all another sight and i loved her better than i have ever loved any of those other women who have loved me since but sterner things were coming my erratic way the proud roman eagle having in these years long tyrannised over fertile gaul must needs swoop down on our brothers along that rocky coast of armorica that faces our white shore carrying death and destruction among our kinsmen as the peregrines in the cliffs harry the frightened sea-mews forthwith the narrow waters were black with our hide-sailed boats rushing to succour but it was useless who could stand against the roman our men came back presently few wounded and crestfallen with long tales of the foeman's deadly might by sea and shore then a little later on we had to fight for ourselves though scantly we had expected it early one morning a friendly veneti came over from gaul and warned the southern princes the stern roman consul caesar was collecting boats and men to invade us at once on this news we were all torn by diverse counsels and jealousies and a blodwin hung in my arms for a tearful space and then sent me eastward with a few men all she could spare from watching her own dangerous neighbours to oppose the roman landing while the priest duallan though exempt by his order from military service followed sullen behind my warlike clansmen we joined other bodies of british until by the beginning of the harvest month we had encamped along the kentish downs in very good force though disunited three days later at dawn came in a runner who said that caesar was landing to the westward how i wished that traitor lie would stick in his false throat and choke him and thither bitterly against my advice went nearly all our men even now it irks me to tell this story while the next young morning was still but a yellow streak upon the sea our keen watchers saw sails coming from the pale gaulish coast and by the time the primrose portals of the day were fully open the water was covered with them from one hand to the other in vain our recalling signal fires smoked a thousand scythed chariots and four thousand men were away and by noon the great consul's foremost galley took the british ground where the beach shelved up to the marshy flats which again rose through coppices and dingles to our camp on the overhanging hills another and another followed all thronged with tawny stalwart men in brass and leather what could we do against this mighty fleet that came headlong upon us rank behind rank the white water flashing in tangled ribbons from their innumerable prows and the dreaded symbols of roman power gleaming from every high-built stern we rushed down disorderly to meet them the druids urging us on with song and sacrifice and waded into the water to our waists for we were as courageous as we were undisciplined and they hesitated for some seconds to leave their lurching boats i remember at this moment when the fate of a kingdom hung in the balance down there jumped a centurion and waving a golden eagle over his head drew his short sword and calling out that he at least would do his duty to the republic made straight for me brave youth as he rushed impetuous through the water my ready javelin took him true under the gilded plate that hung upon his chest and the next wave rolled into my feet a lifeless body lapped in a shroud of crimson foam but now the legionaries were springing out far and near and fighting hand to hand with the skin-clad british who gave way before them slowly and stubbornly 
many were they who died and the floating corpses jostled and rolled about among us as we plunged and fought and screamed in the shallow tide and beat on the swarming impervious golden shields of the invaders back to the beach they drove us hand to hand and foot to foot and then with a long shout of triumph that startled the sea-fowl on the distant cliffs they pushed us back over the shingles even farther from the sea that idly sported with our dead back in spite of all we could do to the marshland there they formed after a breathing space in the long stern line that had overwhelmed a hundred nations and charged us like a living rampart of steel and as the angry waves rushed upon the immovable rocks so rushed we upon them for a moment or two the sun shone upon a wild uproar the fierce contention of two peoples breast to breast a glitter of caps and javelins splintered spears and riven shields all flashing in the wild dust of war that the roman eagle loved so well and then the britons parted into a thousand fragments and reeled back and were trampled under foot and broke and fled britain was lost soon after this all the coppices and pathways were thronged with our flying footmen yet duallan and i being mounted had lingered behind the rest galloping hither and thither over the green levels trying to get some few british to stand again but presently it was time to be gone the romans in full possession of the beach had found a channel and drawn some boats up to the shelving shore they had dropped the hinged bullocks and with the help of a plank or two had already got out some of their twenty or thirty chargers on to these half a dozen eager young patricians had vaulted and i and duallan being conspicuous figures they came galloping down at us we on our lighter steeds knowing every path and gully in the marshlands should have got away from them like starlings from a prowling sheep-dog but treachery was in the black heart of that high priest at my elbow and a ravening hatred which knew neither time nor circumstance it was just at the scraggy foothills and the shouting centurions were close behind us the last of our fighters had dashed into the shelter ahead and i was galloping down a grassy hollow when the coward shearer of mistletoe came up alongside i looked not at him but over my other shoulder at the red plumes of the pursuers dancing on the skyline all in an instant something sped by me and shrieking in pain my horse plunged forward missed his footing and rolled over into the long autumn grass with the scoundrel priest's last javelin quivering in his throat i heard that villain laugh as he turned for a moment to look back and then he vanished into the screen of leaves amazed and dizzy i staggered to my feet pushed back the long hair and the warm running blood from my eyes and grasping my sword waited the onset of the romans they rode over me as though i were a shock of ripe barley in august and one of them springing down put his foot to my throat and made to kill me no no fabrius said another centurion from the back of a white steed don't kill him he will be more useful alive you are always tender-hearted sempronius faunus grumbled the first one reluctantly taking his heel from me and giving permission to rise with a kick in the side what are you going to do with him make him native prefect of these marshes eh or perhaps put in another gilded youth whose sword itched to think it was as yet innocent of blood as when it came from its tuscany smithy perhaps sempronius is going to have a private procession of his own when he gets back to the tiber and wishes early to collect prisoners for his chariot tail disregarding their banter the centurion sempronius who was a comely young fellow and seemed just then extremely admirable in person and principles to me mounted again and pointing with his short sword to the shore bid me march speaking the gallic tongue and in a manner there was no gainsaying so i was prisoner to the romans and they bound me and left me lying for ten hours under the side of one of their stranded ships down by the melancholy afternoon sea still playing with its dead men and rolling and jostling together in its long green fingers the raven-haired etrurian and the pale white-faced celt then when it was evening they picked me up 
and a low plebeian in leather and brass struck me in the face when husky and spent with fighting i asked for a cup of water they took me away through their camp and a mile down the dingles where the roman legionaries were digging fosses and making their camp in the ruddy flicker of watchfires under the british oaks to a rising knoll here the main body of the invaders were lying in a great crescent towards the inland and crowning the hillock was a scarp where a rough pavilion of skins and sails from the vessels on the beach had been erected as we approached this all the noise and laughter died out of my guard who now moved in perfect silence a bowshot away we halted and presently sempronius was seen backing out of the tent with an air of the greatest diffidence seizing me by my manacled arms he led me into it at the very threshold he whispered in my ear britain if you value that tawny skin of yours i saved this morning speak true and straight to him who sits within and without another word he thrust me into the rough pavilion at a little table dark with usage and scarred with campaigning a man was sitting an ample toga partly hiding the close-fitting leather vest he wore beneath it his long and nervous fingers were urging over the tablets before him a stylus with a speed few in those days commanded while a little earthenware lamp with a flickering wick burning in the turned-up spout cast a wavering light upon his thin sharp-cut features the imperious mouth that was shut so tight and the strong lines of his dark commanding face he went on writing as i entered without looking up and my gaze wandered round the poor walls of his tent his piled-up arms in one place his truckle bed in another there a heap of choice british spoil flags and symbols and weapons and there a foreign case half opened stocked with bags of coins and vellum rolls all was martial confusion in the black and yellow light of that strange little chamber and as i turned back to him i felt a shock run through me to find the blackest and most piercing pair of eyes that ever shone from a mortal head fixed upon my face he rose and with the lamp in his hand surveyed me from top to toe of the veneti he said in allusion to my dark un-british hair and i answered no what then i told him i was a knight just now in the service of the british king how many of your men opposed us to-day was the next question a third as many as you brought with you where you were not invited and how many are there in arms behind the downs and in this southern country how many pebbles are there on yonder beach how many ears of corn did we pull last harvest i answered for i thought i should surely die in the morning and this made me brave and surly he frowned very blackly at my defiance but curbing i could see his wrath he put the lamp on the table and after a minute of communing with himself he said in a voice over which policy threw a thin veil of amiability perhaps as a british knight and a good soldier i have no doubt you could speak better with your hands untied i thanked him replying that it was so and he came up freeing with a beautiful little golden stiletto he wore in his girdle my wrists this kindly slight act of soldierly trust obliged me to the roman general and i answered his quick incisive questions in the gaulish tongue as far as honestly might be he got little about our forces finding his prisoner more effusive in this quarter than communicative once or twice when my answers verged on the scornful i saw the imperious temper and haughty nature at strife with his will in that stern masterful face and those keen black eyes but when we spoke of the british people i could satisfy his curious and many questions about them more frankly every now and then as some answer interested him he would take a quick glance at me as though to read in my face whether it were the truth or not and stopping by his little table he would jot down a passage on the wax scan it over and inquire of something else our life and living wars religions friendships all seemed interesting to this acute gentleman so plainly clad and it was only when we had been an hour together and after he had clearly got from me all he wished that he called the guard and dismissed me bidding sempronius in latin which the general thought i knew not to give me food and drink 
but keep me fast for the present. Sempronius showed the utmost deference to the little man in the toga and leather jerkin, listening with bent head and backing from his presence, while I but roughly gave him thanks for my freed hands, and stalked out after my jailer with small ceremony. Once in the starlight and out of earshot, the centurion said to me with a frown, "'Britain, I feel somewhat responsible for you, and I beg the next time you leave that presence not to carry your head so high or turn that wolf-skinned back of yours on him so readily, or I am confident I shall have orders to teach you manners. Did you cast yourself down when you entered? Not I. Jove! And did not kneel when you spoke to him? Not once, I said. Now, by the sacred flame, do you mean to say that you stood the whole time as I found you, towering in your ragged skins, your bare braceleted arms upon your chest, and giving Caesar back stare for stare in his very tent? Who? Caesar himself! Why, who else? Caesar, whose word is life and death from here to the Apennines, who is going to lick up this country of yours as a hungry beggar licks out a porringer? Surely you know that he to whom you spoke so freely was our master, the great Praetor himself. Here was an oversight. I might have guessed so much, but full of other things, I had never supposed the little man was anything but a Roman general sent out to harry and pursue us. Strange ideas rose at once, and while the Tyrian in me was awestruck by the closeness of my approach to a famous and dreaded person, the Briton moaned at a golden opportunity lost, to unravel by one bold stroke, a stroke of poignard, of burning brand from the fire, of anything, the net that was closing over this unfortunate island. So strong rose these latter regrets at having had Caesar the unwelcome, the relentless, within arm's length, and having let him go forth with his indomitable blood still flowing in his lordly veins, that I stopped short, clapped my hand upon my swordless scabbard, and made a hasty stride back to the tent. At once the ready Sempronius was on me like a wildcat, and with two strong legionaries bore me to the ground and tied me hand and foot. They carried me down to the camp, and there pitched me under a rock to reflect until dawn on the things of a disastrous day. But by earliest twilight the bird had flown. At midnight, when the tired soldiers slept, I chafed my hempen bonds against a rugged angle of earth-embedded stone, and in four hours was free, rising silently among the snoring warriors, and passing into the forest as noiselessly as one of those weird black shadows that the last flashes on their expiring campfires made at play on the background of the woods. I stole past their outmost pickets while the first flush of day was in the east, and then, in the open, turned me to my own people, and ran like a hind to her little one over the dewy grasslands and through the spangled thickets, scaring the conies at their earliest meal, and frightening the merles and mavis, ere they had done a bar of their matin songs, throwing myself down in the tents of my kinsmen, just as the round sun shone through the close-packed oak trunks. But curse the caitiff fools who welcomed me there! It would have been far better had I abided the Caesar's anger, or trusted to that martial boy, Sempronius Faunus. The British churls, angry and sullen at their defeat of yesterday, were looking for a victim to bear the burden of their wrongs. Now the priest, Duallon, who had turned livid with fear and anger when I had come back unharmed from the hands of the enemy, with a ready wit which was surely lent him from hell, saw he might propitiate the Britons and gratify his own ends by one more coward trick to be played at my expense. I do not deny his readiness, or grudge him aught, yet I hate him even now from the bottom of my heart, with all that fierce old anger, which then would have filled me with delight and pride, if I could have had his anointed blood smoking in the runnels of my sword. Well, it was his turn again, he procured false witnesses, not a difficult thing for a high priest in that discontented camp, and by midday I was bound once more, and before the priests and chiefs as a traitor and Roman spy. What good was it for me to stand up and tell the truth to that gloomy circle, while the angry crowd outside hungered for a propitiatory sacrifice? 
in vain i lied with all the resources i could muster and in vain when this was fruitless denounced the pale villain my accuser when i came to tell of his treachery in killing my horse the day before and leaving me to be slain by the enemy i saw i was but adding slander in the judge's eyes to my other crimes when i declared i was no roman but a briton an aged fool his long white locks filleted with oak leaves rose silently and held a polished brass mirror before me and by every deity in the northern skies i must own my black hair and dusky face was far more roman than native so they found me guilty and sentenced me to be offered up to baal next morning before the army as a detected spy when that silvery dawn came it brought no relief or respite for the laws of the druids which enjoins slow and deliberate judgments forbade the altering of a sentence once pronounced it was as fine a day as could be wished for their infernal ceremonial with the mellow autumn mist lying wide and flat along the endless vistas of oak and hazel that then hid almost all the valleys and over the mist the golden rays of the sun spread far and near kissing with crimson radiance the green knobs of upland that shone above that pearly ocean and shining upon the bare summits of the lonely grass hills around us and gleaming in rosy brilliancy upon the sea that flashed and sparkled in grey and gold between the downs to the southward here in this fairy realm while the thickets were still beaded with the million jewels of the morning and the earth breathed of repose and peace they carried out that detestable orgy of which i was the centre my memory is a little hazy perhaps at the time i was thinking of other things a red-haired girl for instance playing with her little ones outside her porch in a distant glen my shekels of brass and tin and silver my kine my dogs and my horses mayhap such things will be and thus i know little of how it came but presently i was on the fatal spot a wide circle of green grass kept short and close in the heart of a dense thicket of oak round this circle a ring of great stone columns crowned by mighty slabs of the same kind and hung to-day with all the skins and robes and weapons of the assembled tribesmen so that the mighty enclosure was a rude amphitheatre walled by the wealth of the spectators and in the centre an oblong rock some eight feet long with a gutter down it for the blood to run into a pit at its feet this was the fatal slip from which the druids launched that poor vessel the soul upon the endless ocean of eternity all round the great circle when its presence and significance suddenly burst upon me were the british to the number of many hundreds squatting on the ground in the front rows or standing behind against the grey pillars an uncouth ring of motley barbarians shaggy with wolf and bearskins gleaming in brass and golden links that glistened in the morning light against naked limbs and shoulders traced and pictured in blue woad with a hundred designs of war and woodcraft they forced me and two other miserable wretches to the altar and then while our guards stood by us and the mounted men clustered among the monoliths behind a deadly silence fell upon the assembly it was so still we could hear the beat of our own hearts and so intolerable that one of us three fell forward in a swoon ere it had lasted many minutes the din of battle was like the murmur of a pleasant brook before that expectant hush and when the white procession of executioners came chanting up the farther avenue of stones into the arena i breathed again as though it was a nuptial procession and they were bringing me a bride less grim than the golden adze which shone at their head they sang round the circle their mystic song and then halted before the rude stone altar mixing up religion and justice as was their wont the chief druid recited the crimes of the two culprits beside me with their punishment and immediately the first one tightly bound was pitched upon the stone altar and while the druids chanted their hymns to baal the assembled multitude joined in and clanging their shields in an infernal tumult which effectively drowned his yells for mercy the sacred adze fell and first his head and then his body rolled into the hollow while twenty little streams of crimson blood 
trickled down the sides of the altar stone. The next one was treated in the same way, and tumbled off into the hollow below, and I was hoisted up to that wrecking slab. While they arranged me, that black priest stole up and hissed in my ear, Is it a bloodwin you think when you shut your eyes? Take this then for your final comfort, he said with a malicious leer. I, even I, the despised and thwarted, will see to Bloodwin and answer for her happiness. Ah, you writhe! I thought that would interest you. Let your last thought, accursed stranger, be I and she. Let your last conception be my near revenge. Villain, I spit upon and deride you. And he was as good as his word, glowering down upon me, helpless, with insatiate rage and hatred in his eyes, and then, stepping back, signed to the executioner. I heard the wild hymn to their savage gods go ringing up again through the green leaves of the oaks. I heard the clatter of the weapons upon the round brass-bound targets, the voices of the priests and the cry of a startled kite circling in the pleasant autumn mist overhead. I saw the great crescent of the sacred golden adze swing into the sky, and then, while it was just checking to the fall which should extinguish me, there came a hush upon the people, followed by a wild shout of fear and anger, and I turned my head half over as I lay bound upon the stone. I saw the British multitude seethe in confusion, and then burst and fly like the foam strands before the wind, as, out of the green thickets at the run, their cold brave faces, all emotionless over their long brass shields, came rank upon rank of Roman legionaries. I saw Sempronius on his white charger at their head, glittering in brass and scarlet, and finding my tongue in my extremity. Sempronius! I yelled. Sempronius to the rescue! But too late. With a wavering aimless fall, the adze descended between my neck and my shoulder. The black curtain of dissolution fell over the painted picture of the world. There was a noise of a thousand rivers tumbling into a bottomless cavern, and I expired. End of chapter 2「Chapter 3 of The Wonderful Adventures of Fra the Phoenician by Edwin Lester Arnold this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I do confess I can offer no justification for the continuation of my story. Once so fairly sped as I was on that long distant day, thus recalled in such detail as I can remember, the natural and regular thing would be that there should be an end of me, with, perhaps, a page or two added by some kindly scribe to recall my too quickly smothered virtues. Nevertheless I write again, not a whit the worse for a mischance which would have silenced many a man, and in a mood to tell you of things wonderful enough to strain the sides of your shallow modern scepticism, as new wine stretches a goatskin bottle. All the period between my death on the druid altar and my reawakening was a void, whereof I can say but little. The only facts pointing a faint clue to the wonderful lapse of life are the brief phenomena of my reawakening, which came to hand in sequence, as they are here set down. My first consciousness was little better than a realisation of the fact that practically I was extinct. To this pointless knowledge there came a dawning struggle with the powers of mortality, until, very slowly, inch by inch, the negativeness was driven back, and the spark of life began to brighten within me. To this moment I cannot say how long the process took. It may have been days or weeks or months or ages as likely as not. But when the vital flame was kindled, the life and self-possession spread more quickly, until at last, with little fluttering breaths like a newborn baby's, and a tingling trickle of warm blood down my shrunken veins, in one strange minute, four hundred years after the close of my last spell of living, as I afterwards learned, I feebly opened my eyes and recognised with dull contentment that I was alive again. But, oh, the sorrows attendant on it! Every bone and muscle in me ached to that awakening, 
and my very fibre shook to the stress of the making tide of vitality you who have lain upon an arm for a sleepy hour or two and suffered as a result ingenious torments from the new moving blood think of the like sorrows of four hundred years stagnation it was scarcely to be borne and yet like many other things of which the like might be said i bore it in bitterness of spirit until life had trickled into all the unfamiliar pathways of my clay and then at length the pain decreased and i could think and move in that strange and lonely hour of temporal resurrection almost complete darkness surrounded me and my mind with one certain consciousness that i had been very long where i lay was a chaos of speculation and fancy and long-forgotten scenes but as my faculties came more completely under control and my eyes accepted the dim twilight as sufficient and convenient to them they made out overhead a dull massy roof of rock rough with the strong masonry of mother earth and descending in rugged sides to an uneven floor in fact there could be no doubt i was underground but how far down and where and why could not be said all round me were cavernous hollows and midnight shadows round which the weird gleam of rude pillars and irregular walls made a heavy mysterious coast to a black uncertain sea i sat up and rubbed my eyes and as i did so i felt every rag of clothing drop in dust and shreds from my person and peered into the almost impenetrable gloom my outstretched hands on one side touched the rough rocks of what was apparently the arch of a niche in this chamber of the netherworld and under me they discovered a sandy shelf upon which i lay some eight or ten feet from the ground as near as could be judged not a sound broke the stillness but the gentle monotony of falling water whereof one unseen drop twice a minute fell with a faint silver cadence on to the surface of an unknown pool i did not fear i was not frightened and soon i noticed as a set-off to the gloom of my sullen surroundings the marvellous purity of the atmosphere it was a preservative itself such an ambient limpid element could surely have existed nowhere else it was soft as velvet in its absolute stillness and pure beyond suspicion it was like some thin sunless vintage that had mellowed endless years in the great vat of the earth and it now ran with the effect of a delicate tonic through my inert frame nor was its sister and ally the temperature less conducive to my cure in that subterranean place summer and winter were alike unknown the trivial changes that vex the cuticle of the world were here reduced to an unalterable average of gentle warmth that assimilated with the soulless air to my huge contentment you cannot wonder therefore that i throve apace and explored with increasing strength the limits of my strange imprisonment all about me was fine deep dust and shreds which even then smelt in my palm like remnants of fur and skins at my elbow was a shallow british eating dish with a little dust at the bottom and by it a broken earthenware pitcher such as they used for wine on my other side as i felt with inquisitive fingers lay a handleless sword one of my own i knew but thin with age the point all gone rusty and useless by it again reposed a small jar heavy to lift and rattling suggestively when shaken my two fingers thrust into the neck told me it was full of coins and i could not but feel a flush of gratitude in that grim place at the abortive kindness which had put food and drink weapons and money by my side with a sweet ignorance yet certainty of my future awakening but now budding curiosity suggested wider search and rising with difficulty i cautiously dropped from my lofty shelf on to the ground then a wish to gain the outer air took possession of me and peering this way and that a tiny point of light far away on the right attracted my attention on approaching it turned out to be a small hole in the cave out of reach overhead but feeling about below this little star of comfort the walls appeared soft and peaty to the touch 
so at once i was at work digging hard with a pointed stone and the farther i went the more leafy and rough became the material while hope sent my heart thumping against my ribs in tune to my labour at last impulsive after half an hour's work a fancy seized me that i could heave a way out with my shoulder no sooner said than done i took ten steps back and then plunged fiercely in the darkness of the great cavern into the mouldy screen how can i describe the result it gave way and i shot in a whirlwind of dust into a sparkling golden world i rolled over and over down a spangled firmament clutching in my bewilderment my hands full of blue and yellow gems at every turn and slipping and plunging with a sirocco of colour red green sapphire and gold flying round before my bewildered face i finally came to a stop and sat up you will not wonder that i glared round me when i say i was seated at the foot of all the new marvels of a beautiful limestone knoll clothed from top to bottom with bluebells and primroses spangled with the young spring greenery of hazel and beech overhead and backed by the cloudless blue of an april sky on top of this fairy mountain at the roots of the trees that crowned it hidden by bracken and undergrowth was the round hole from which i had plunged nor need i tell you how remembering what had happened in there i rubbed my eyes and laughed and marvelled greatly at the will of the inscrutable which had given me so wonderful a rebirth to you must be left to fill up the picture of my sensations and slowly recurring faculties how i lay and basked in the warmth and slowly remembered everything to me belongs but the strange and simple narrative one of my first active desires was for breakfast nor as my previous meal had been four centuries earlier will i apologise for this weakness but where and how should it be had this question soon answered itself sauntering hither and thither the low shoulder of the ridge was presently crossed and a narrow footway into the woods leading to some pleasant pastures entered upon before i had gone far up this shady track a pail of milk in her hand and whistling a ditty to herself came tripping towards me as pretty a maid as had ever twisted a bit of white hawthorn into her amber hair i let her approach and then stepping out made the most respectful salutation within the knowledge of ancient british courtesy but alas my appearance was against me and roman fancies had peopled the hills with jolly satyrs for one of which no doubt the damsel took me as i bowed low the dust of centuries cracked all down my back i was tawny and grim and unshaved and completely naked though i had forgotten it and even my excellent manners could not warrant my disingenuousness against such a damning appearance she screamed with fear and letting go her milk jar turned and fled with a nimbleness which would have left even the hot old wood god himself far in the rear however the milk remained and peering into the pitcher here seemed the very thing to recuperate me by easy stages so i retired to a cosy dell and between copious draughts of that fine natural liquor overwhelmed with blessings the sleek kine and the comely maid who milked them indeed the stuff ran into my withered processes like a freshet stream into a long dry country it consoled and satisfied me and afterwards i slept as an infant all that night and far into another sun the next day brought several needs with it the chief of these were more food more clothes and a profession since fate seemed determined to make me take another space of existence upon the world all three were satisfied eventually as for the first two i was not particular as to fashion or diet and easily supplied them in the course of a morning stroll a shepherd's hut was discovered and on approaching it cautiously the little shed turned out to be empty however the owner had left several sheepskin mantles and rough homespun clothes on pegs round the walls and to these i helped myself sufficiently to convert an unclothed caveman into a passable yeoman also i made free with his store of oat cakes and coarse cheese putting all not needed back upon his shelf 
here i was again fed and clothed but what to do next was the question to consider the knotty matter after spending most of the day in purposeless wandering i went up to the top of my own hill the one that unknown to every one had the cavern in it and there pondered the subject long the whole face of the country perplexed me it was certainly britain but britain so amplified and altered as to be hardly recognisable wide fields were everywhere broad roads traversed the hills and valleys with impartial straightness the great woodlands of the earlier times were gone or much curtailed while wonderful white buildings shone here and there among the foliage and down away in the west by a river the sunbeams glinted on the roofs and temple fronts of a fine unknown town that was the place it seemed to me at length to refit for another voyage on the strange sea of chance but i was too experienced in the ways of the world to travel citywards with an empty wallet while meditating upon the manner in which this deficiency might be met the golden store of coins left in the cave below suddenly presented themselves the very thing and as heavy purple clouds were piling up round the presently sinking sun earth and sky alike presaging a storm that evening the cavern would be a convenient place to sleep in finding the entrance with some difficulty and noticing but with no special attention that it looked a little larger than when last seen my first need was fire this i had to make for myself in the pouch of the shepherd's jerkin was a length of rough twine this would do for matches while as a torch a resinous pine branch bruised and split served well enough fixing one end of the string to a bush i took a turn round a dry stick and then began laboriously rubbing backwards and forwards in half an hour the string fumed pleasantly and something under the hour one was nothing if not patient in that age it charred and burst into flame just as evening set in and the earth opened its pores to the first round drops of the warm smelling rain that pattered on the young forest leaves and the thunder began to murmur distantly under the purple mantle of the coming storm my torch spluttering and hissing i entered the vast gloomy chamber of my sleep and not without a sense of awe stole up along the walls a hundred yards or more to my strange couch the coins were safe and shining greenly in their earthen jar so sticking the light into a cleft i poured them onto the sand and then commenced to tuck the stuff away as fast as might be into my girdle it was strange wild work the only company my own contorted shadow on the distant rocks and such wild forms of cruel british superstition as my excited imagination called up the only sound the rumble of the storm now overhead and the hissing drip of the red rosin gleaming on the wealth all stamped with images of long dead kings and consuls that i was cramming into my pouch by the time the task was nearly finished i was in a state of nerves equal to seeing or hearing anything no doubt long fasting had shaken a mind usually calm and callous enough and therefore you will understand how the blood fell from my limbs and the cold perspiration burst out upon my forehead when having scarified myself with traditions of ghouls and cave devils i turned to listen for a moment to the dull rumble of the thunder and the melancholy wave-like sough of the wind in the trees even here audible and beheld twenty paces from me in the shadows a vast shaggy black form grim and broad as no mortal ever was and red and wavering in the uncertain light seven feet high and possessed of two fiery gleaming eyes that were bent upon my own with a horrible fixity i and that monstrous shadow glared at each other until my breath came back when leaning a moment more against the side of the cavern i suddenly snatched the torch from its cleft with a yell of consternation that was multiplied a thousand times by the echoes until it was like the battle-cry of a legion of bad spirits and started off in the supposed direction of the entrance but before ten yards had been covered in that headlong rush i tripped over a loose stone and in another moment had fallen prone plunging thereby the spluttering torch into one of the many little pools of water with which the floor was pitted 
with a hiss and splutter the light went out and absolute darkness enveloped everything just where i had fallen stood a round boulder a couple of yards broad it had seemed and some five feet high i sprang to this instinctively clutching it with my hands just as those abominable green eyes brighter than ever in the vortex got to the other side and hesitated there in doubt then began the most dreadful game i ever played with a forfeit attaching to it not to be thought of you will understand the cave was absolute sterile blackness to me a dim world in which the only animated points were the twin green stars of the cruel ghoul my unknown enemy as those glided round to one side of the little rock i as cautiously edged off to the other then back they would come and back i went now this way and now that sometimes only an inch or two and sometimes making a complete circle with every nerve at fullest stretch and every sense on tiptoe why all this time it might be asked did i not run for the entrance but in reply the first frightened turn or two round the boulder had made chaos of my geography and a start in any direction then might have dashed me into the side of the cave prone at the mercy of the horrible thing whose hot coarse breath fanned me quicker and quicker as the game grew warm and more exciting so near was it that i could have stretched out my hands if i had dared and touched the monstrous being that i knew stood under those baleful planets that glistened in the black firmament now here and now there how long exactly we dodged and shuffled and panted round that stone in the darkness cannot be said it was certainly an hour or more but it went on so long that even in my panting stress and excitement it grew dull after a time so monotonous was it and i found myself speculating on the weather while i danced vis-a-vis -vis to my grim partner in that frightful pastime yes i said a very bad storm indeed once to the left and nearly overhead now right it is a good thing twice round and back again to be so a sharp spin round and round he nearly had me conveniently under cover twice to the left and then back by the opposite side well it could not have lasted for ever and i was nearly spent the boulder seemed hot and throbbing to my touch and the floor was undulating gently as it does when you land from a voyage already fifty or sixty green eyes seemed circling in fiery orbits before me when an extraordinary thing befell the thunder and lightning had been playing wildly overhead for some minutes and the rain was coming down in torrents even the noise of rushing hill streams being quite audible in that clear resonant space when all of a sudden there came a pause and then the fall of a titanian hammer on the dome of the hill a rending resounding crash that shook mother earth right down to her innermost ribs at the same instant before we could catch our breath the whole side of the cave opposite to us some hundreds of paces of rugged wall was deluged with a living oscillating drapery of blue flame that magnificent refulgence came down from above a glowing cascade of light it overran the rocks like a beautiful gauze clinging lovingly to their sinuousness and wrapping their roughness in a tender palpitating mantle of its own winsome brightness it ran its nimble fiery tendrils down the veins and crevices and leapt in fierce playfulness from point to point spinning its electric gossamers in that vacuum air like some enchanted tissue spread between the crags it ran to the ledges and trickled off in ambient sparkling cascades it overflowed the sandy bottom in tender sheets of blue and mauve feeling here and there with a million fingers for the way it sought and then it found it and sank as silent as ghostly as wonderful as it had come all this was but the work of an instant but an instant of such concentrated brightness that i saw every detail as i have told you of that beautiful thing more in that second of glowing visibility while the blue torch of the storm still shone in the chamber of the underground i saw the stone by me and beyond it 
towering amazed and stupid with his bulky strength outlined against the light a great cave bear in all his native ruggedness better still a bowshot on my right was the narrow approach of the entrance and as the gleam sank into the nether world almost as quick as that gleam itself with a heart of wonder and fear and a foot like the foot of the night wind overhead i was gone and down the sandy floor and through the gap and into the outer world and midnight rain i plunged once more grateful and glad after such hair-breadth escapes there was little need to bemoan a wet coat and an evening under the lee of a heathery scar when the morning arrived clear and bright as it often does after a storm i felt in no mood to hang about the locality but shook the rain from my fleece and breakfasting on a little water from the brook a staff in my hand and my dear bought wealth in my belt set out for the unknown town whose wet roofs shone like molten silver over the dark and dewy oak woods five hours tramping brought me there and truly the city astonished me greatly could this indeed be britain was the constant question on my tongue as i trod fair white streets with innumerable others opening down from them on either hand and noticed the evidence of such art and luxury as hitherto i had dreamed the exclusive prerogative of the capital of the older empires here were baths before which the roman youth dawdled stately theatres with endless tiers of seats from whose rostra degenerate sons of the soil aping their masters in dress and speech recited verse and dialogue trimmed to the latest orator in fashion by the tiber mansions and palaces there were outside which the sleek steeds of consuls and praetors champed gilded bits while waiting to carry their owners to gay procession and ceremonial temples to apollo and shrines to venus dotted the ways forums market-places and the like in bewildering profusion and among all these evidences of the new age thronged a motley mixture of people the thoughtful senator coming from conclave with his toga and parchments elbowed the callow british rustic in the rude raiment of his fathers the wild blue-eyed welsh prince upon his rough mountain pony would scarce give right of way to the bronzed roman mercenary from the rhine umbrians and franks pale-haired germans and olive tuscans laughed and chaffered round the booths and fountains while here and there legionaries stood on guard before great houses or drank on the trestles of wayside wine-shops now and again two or three soldiers came marching down the street with a gang of slaves or a shock-headed chieftain from the wild north fierce and sullen on his way to rome and over all the varied throng the crows and kites circled in the blue sky and the little sparrows perched themselves under the lintel and in the twisted column tops of their mistress's fane half the day i stared and then having eaten some dry etrurian grapes the first for four hundred years i went to the bath and threw down a golden coin on the doorkeeper's marble slab why my son said that juvenile official of some trivial fifty summers where in the name of mercury did you pick up this antique thing and he handled it curiously but being in no mind to tell my tale just then i put him off lightly and passed on to the great bathing-place itself stage by stage balneum concamerata sudatio tepidarium frigidarium and all the other chambers i went through until in the last a mighty slave who had rubbed me with the strength of hercules himself for half an hour suddenly stopped and surveying me intently exclaimed master i have scrubbed many a strange thing from many a roman body but i will swallow all my own towels if i can get this extraordinary dirt from you and he pointed to my bare and glowing chest there to my astonishment revealed for the first time was a great serpent-like mark of tattoo and woad circling my body in two wide zones what it meant how it came was past my comprehension shrunk and shrivelled as i was with long abstemiousness it seemed but like a gigantic smudge meandering down my person a smudge however that with a little goodly living might stretch out into an elaborate design of some nature of course i knew it was thus the british warriors were accustomed to adorn themselves 
but who had been thus purposely decorating one that had never knowingly submitted to the operation and to what end was past my guessing never mind sir don't despond said the slave we will have another essay and hitching me on to the rubbing couch he knelt upon my stomach these bath attendants were no more deferential than they are now and exerted his magnificent strength armed with the stiffest towel that ever came off a loom upon me until i fairly thought that not only would he have the tattoo off but also all the skin upon which it was engrossed but it was to no purpose he rose presently and sulkily declared i had had my money's worth the more he rubbed the bluer those accursed marks became this might well be so i tossed him an extra coin and dressing hastily covered my uninvited tattoo and went forth fully determined to examine and read it for those things were nearly always readable more closely on a better and more private opportunity my next visit was to an etruscan barber who was shaving all and sundry under a green white awning in a pleasant little piazza to him i sat and while he reaped my antique stubble with many an exclamation of surprise and disgust at its toughness my thoughts wandered away to the train of remembrances the bath slave's discovery had started again i thought of blodwyn and my little one the seaport with its golden beaches and the quiet pools where the trout and salmon of an evening now and again shattered the crystal mirror of the surface in their sport as she and i sat on some grassy bank and talked of village statecraft of conquests over petty princelings of crops and harvests of love and war then again i thought of the roman galleys and caesar the penman autocrat of the british camp and lastly the great mischance which had and yet had not ended me ah that was a bad slash indeed sir wasn't it queried the barber in my ear may i ask in what war you took it this very echo of my fancy came so startlingly true i sprang to my feet and glowered upon him o oh, colour of herbs i said o oh, trespasser along the verge of mystery and medicine pointing to the dried things and electuaries with which in common then with his kind his booth was stocked where got you the power of reading minds he shook his head vaguely as though he did not understand pointing to my neck and replying he knew naught of what my thoughts might have been but there on my shoulder was obvious evidence of the slash he had alluded to i took the steel mirror he offered me and sure enough i saw a monstrous white seam upon my tawny skin healed and well but very obvious after the bath and shaving why sir i have dressed many a wound in my time but that must have been about as bad a one as a man could get and live how did it happen oh i forget just now forget then you must have a marvellously bad memory why a thing like that one might remember for four hundred years said the sagacious little barber bending his keen eyes on me in a way that was uncomfortable in fact he soon made me so ill at ease being very reluctant that my secret should pass into possession of the town through his garrulous tongue that i hastily paid him another of those antique green coins of mine and passed on again down the great wide street even he who lives two thousand years is still the serf of time therefore i cannot describe all the strange things i saw in that beautiful foreign city set down on the native english land but presently i tired and having become a roman by exchanging my sheepskins for a fine scarlet toga over a military cuirass of close-fitting steel inlaid after the fashion with turquoise and gold enamel sandals upon my feet and a short sword at my side i sought somewhere to sleep first i chanced upon a little house set back from the main thoroughfare and over the door a withered bush and underneath it on a label was written thus hic habitat felicitas ah i said as i hammered at the portal with the brass knob of my weapon if indeed happiness is landlord here then fra the phoenician is the man to be his tenant but it would not do bacchus was too bibulous in that little abode and cupid too blind and indiscriminate so it was left behind and presently an open villa was reached where travellers might rest and here i took a chamber on one side of the square marble courtyard facing on a garden and fountain 
and looking over a fair stretch of country no sooner had i eaten than very curious to understand the nature of the bath slave's discoveries upon my skin i went to the disrobing room of the private baths and discarding my gorgeous cuirass and piling the gilded arms and silken wrappings with which a new-born vanity had swathed me in a corner i stood presently revealed in the common integument the one immutable fashion of humanity but rarely before had the naked human body presented so much diversity as mine did i was mottled and pictured from my waist upwards in the most bewildering manner all in blue and purple tints just as the slave had said there were more pictures on me than there are on an astrologer's celestial globe and as i turned hither and thither before my great burnished metal mirror a whole constellation of dim uncertain meaning rose and set upon my sphere now this was the more curious because as i have said i had never in my life submitted me for a moment to the needle and unguents of those who in british time made a practice of the art of tattooing i had seen young warriors under that painful process and had stood by as they yelled in pain and reluctant patience while the most elaborate designs grew up under the stolid draughtsman's hands upon their quivering cuticle but to blodwyn's grief who would have had me equal to any of her tribesmen in pattern as in place i had ever scorned to be made a mosaic of superstition and flourishes how then had this mighty maze this pictorial web of blue myth and marvel grown upon me during the night-time of my sleep on studying it closely it evolved itself into some order and though that night i made not very much of it yet as time went on and my body grew sleek and fair with good living the design came up with constantly increasing vigour indeed the narrative i translated from it was so absorbingly interesting to one in my melancholy circumstances that again and again i would hurry away to my closet and mirror to see what new detail what subtle deduction of stroke or line had come into view upon the scroll of the strangest diary that ever was written for indeed it was blodwyn's diary that circled me thus it began in the small of my back with the year of my demise upon the druid altar and ever as she wrote it she must have rolled with tender industry her journal over and over and so worked up from my back in a splendid widening zone of token and hieroglyphic for twenty changing seasons until my chest was reached and there the tale ran out in a thin and tremulous way which it made my heart ache to understand there is no need to describe exactly the mode of deduction or how i came to comprehend without key or help the sense of the things before me but you will understand my wits were sharp in the quest and once the main scheme of the idea was understood the rest came easily enough the princess then had taken a sheaf of corn as her symbol of the year there were twenty of them upon me and i judged their varying sizes were intended to indicate good or bad harvest seasons in the territories of my careful chieftainness round these central signs she had grouped such other marks or outlines as served to hint the changing fortunes of the times there were heads of oxen by each sheaf varying in size according to the conditions of her herds and fishes big or small to indicate what luck her salmon spearsmen had met with by the tuneful rapids of that ancient stream i knew so well following these early designs was one that interested me greatly the gentle chieftainess had when i left her expectation of another member to her tribe of her own providing i had thought when we should have beaten the romans to hurry back and mayhap be in time to welcome this little one but you know how i was prevented and now here upon my skin nigh over to my heart was the sketch and outline of what seemed a small new-born maid all beswaddled in the british fashion and very lovingly limbed but what was more curious was that its wraps were turned back from its baby shoulder and there to my astonished interpretation in that silent maternal narrative was just the likeness broad lasting indelible of the frightful scar i wore myself long i pondered upon this had that red-haired slave princess by some chance received me back 
perhaps at sempronin's compassionate hands all hurt as i was and had that portentous wound set its seal during anxious vigils upon the unborn babe i could not guess i could but wonder and wondering still pass on to what came next here was a graphic picture no bigger than the palm of my hand and not hard to unriddle an eagle no doubt the roman one engaged in fierce conflict with a beaver that being bloodwin's favourite tribal sign for there were many of those animals upon her river jove how well twas done there were the flying feathers and the fur and the turmoil and the litter of the fight and well i guessed the proud roman bird that day he brought my gallant tribe under the yoke had lost many a stalwart quill and damaged many a lordly pinion and besides these main records of this fair and careful chancelloress of her state there were others that moved me none the less yes by every gloomy spirit that dwelt in the misty shadows of the british oaks it gave me a hot flush of gratified revenge to see there by the symbol of the first year a severed bleeding head still crowned with the druid oak oh to alan my friend i laughed as i guessed the meaning of that bloody sign so they tripped you up at last my crafty villain by all the fiends of your abominable worship i should like to have seen the stroke that made that grisly trophy well i can guess how it came about some slighted tribesman who saw me die peached upon you liar and traitor i can see you stand in that old british hall strong in your sanctity and cunning making your wicked version of the fight and my undoing and then methinks i see blodwin leap to her feet red and fiery with her anger a cursed priest how you must have sickened and shrunk from her fierce invective the headlong damnation of her bitter accusation with all the ready evidence with which she supported it mayhap your cheeks were as pale that day good friend as your infernal vestments and first you frowned and pointed to the signs and symbols of your office and pleaded your high appointments before the assembled people against the answering of the charge and then when that would not do you whined and cringed and called her kinswoman oh but i can fancy it and how my pretty princess there upon her father's steps scorned and cursed you before them all and how some ready faithful hand struck you down and how they tore your holy linen from you and dragged you screaming to the gateway and there upon the threshold log struck your wicked head from your abominable shoulders by the sacred mistletoe i can read my blodwin's noble anger in every puncture of that revenge commemorating outline here again in the years that followed it pleasured me to see her little state grow strong and wide at one time she typified the coming and destruction of two peak-sailed southern pirates and then the building of a new stockade she also made perhaps to the worship of my mains a mighty circle it began with a single upright on my side the next year there were two in the summer that followed she crossed them by a third great slab and so on for ten years the tribesmen seemed to have toiled and laboured until they had such a temple of the sun as must have given my sweet heathen vast pleasure to look upon she feared comments and portents much and punctured me with them most exactly she kept her memoranda of corn pots and stores of hides upon me like the clever frugal mother of her tribe she was and now and then she acquired territory or made new alliances printing the special tokens of their heads in a circle with her own until i was illustrated from waist to shoulder a living lexicon of history many were the details of that strange blue record i have not mentioned many are the strokes and flourishes that still expand and contract to the pulsations of my mighty life undeciphered unintelligible but i have said enough to show you how ingenious it was how sufficient in its variety how disappointing in its pointless end for indeed it stopped suddenly at the twentieth season and the cause thereof i could guess only too well there in that roman hotel i stayed reflecting it was in this rest-house from the idle gossip of the loungers and chatter of roman politicians 
that i came to comprehend the extent of my sleep in the cave and as the truth dawned upon me with a consciousness of the infinite vacuity of my world i went into the garden and there was no light in the sunshine and no colour in the flowers and no music in the fountain and i threw my toga over my head and grieved for my loneliness with the hum of the crowd outside in my ears and mourned my fair princess and all the ancient times so young in memory yet so old in fact many days i sorrowed purposeless and then my grief was purged by the good medicine of hardship and more adventure End of chapter 3